welcome to JCPS Digital Learning Live. Uh, my name is Matt Volka of Digital Innovation, and I am super excited to be on this episode to celebrate, celebrate our remarkable educators, educators across JCPS. Uh, today, I am joined by some of our other Digital Innovation team. We have Daniel Washburn, Elaine Abinata, Kathleen Receiver, and Shade Braves. How are you guys doing today? Also joining us today is Raymond Green, the principal at Central High School, and with him are Crystal Zaresberg and Kristen Dennis to talk to us about their r framework. Elaine will be running the control room today and taking questions from the YouTube live chat, so please make sure you drop that there and introduce yourself as well, as let us know what school or district topic you are from. If you don't have the chat capability, please make sure you log in to YouTube and while you're there, check the subscribe button too, so you can continue to learn about it. What we've been working on here at Central High School uh, really is some exciting work, so we'll just hop right in if that's all right. I'll do my screen share uh, so you can see uh, what we have prepared for you guys today. All right, so first I want to just talk a little bit about um, you know what we want to get done today, and really I, I want to encourage a lot of educational innovation as much as possible. I want to share why, how, and what research and innovation is for us here at Central. We'll talk a little bit about one of our six uh, school-wide competencies that we've identified, and then lessons learned, uh, because it is a, a learning experience for us in the last uh, year and a half or so. <clears throat> so for us here at Central High School, um, you know, research and innovation is more than technology. And there are times where a pencil is the appropriate deployment of technology. And there are times where a Chromebook is the appropriate deployment of technology. And so we've had a lot of conversation around uh, understanding that research and innovation is not just giving a kid a Chromebook. But what are we asking the students to do? What are we asking them to create? What are we asking teachers to do and to create has really been the kind of the driving question here for us. So why are we even doing it? Why are we doing research and innovation? Uh, it's a great question and I'll tell you why. The reason why is because Central High School started in 1873 as Louisville Colored School. Uh, and prior to that, there were no public uh, schools uh, for African-Americans in our city. And so if you fast forward to 1882, um, that's when Central becomes a high school. Louisville Colored School becomes a, a high school, Central Colored High School. And that was our first major innovation. You know, so when we think about innovation, it's not always necessarily technology, a lot of times it is. But it really is, uh, innovation has to be about uh, improving the quality of lives of the people. And so that means starting a school, that's an innovation. And throughout our school's history, Central has been a leader of innovative practices. We've just never told our story that way. And uh, if we had more time, I would go throughout some landmark events in our school's history where we have been leaders of innovation. And so that's our school vision statement. And you'll see it at the bottom of every screen where we are relentlessly continuing our tradition as leaders of positive social change, uh, because that's what we've been about since 1873. So another kind of thing to think about when we think about you know this framework and where did it come from, uh, we, we read a book uh, called The Art of Critical Pedagogy. And this quote really kind of helped drive the steer the ship for us. And the quote says that urban schools are not broken they're doing what they're designed to do. Um, and when we take a look at what's going on in our schools today, you know, are they really broken or are they doing what they're designed to do? And we wanted to say, what's central design to do? And how can we be innovative in the design of our school, uh, particularly when it, when it relates to the instruction of the school? Another powerful quote from a great book I would highly recommend uh, if anyone uh, wants to read it, if you've not read it, uh, it's called Teaching in the Fourth Industrial Revolution. It says that an education system that does not address this trend, uh, me being the fourth industrial revolution, is irrelevant. An education system or a school that's unable to adapt to the speed of innovation in, in society is obsolete. An education system that is not preparing the citizens to be happy and healthy in the world uh, that they live is worthless. And you know that the speed of innovation is, is the slowest it's ever gonna be. It's not slowing down. Uh, and so as schools, are we nimble enough? Do we have the fluidity enough uh, to move with society and prepare our kids for jobs that don't even exist yet. You know? So this is why another big why we're pursuing this idea of research and innovation. Uh, and then lastly, it's because of the three pillars. You know, we've asked teachers to do the backpack of success skills and, and our teachers are killing it. They're doing a great job. Uh, but how do we get there? How do we give kids and teachers um, so many opportunities to have backpack worthy artifacts or quality work um, is there a way to do that in a systemic uh, manner? 
Also racial equity, you know, when we think about giving kids opportunity, a lot of racial equity is about giving kids access uh, to unique learning opportunities. Um, and so we want to ensure here at Central High School, we're a school that's 83% students of color. Um, and typically when you look at our country, students of color don't, aren't always guaranteed um, innovative learning experiences, but at Central High School, our kids are guaranteed innovative learning experiences. So we. We believe that R and I for us is a racial equity issue, and then when it comes to climate and culture, <clears throat> this uh, R and I piece really does start to change how we approach um, teaching and learning in our school, and that's really the meat of what we want to talk about today. So, with that in mind, what is research and innovation? It's a mindset for us. Uh, it's a way of thinking. It's a way of going about tackling problems in the school. Uh, but in addition to that, it's a theme that can touch every classroom. Uh, in, in band class, you can research and innovate. In nursing, you can research and innovate. In English, as we'll hear about in a minute, you can research and innovate. But put some meat to it. You have to have a skeleton. And so that's where the framework comes in. And that's what we're going to really hit on today, one of our six competencies in our framework. So the next thing is we're going to talk a little bit about how we develop our framework. And uh, Ms. Therensburg is going to talk about that for us today. So back in October of 2018, this is when uh, Mr. Green presented this entire idea to me as well um, at that time. And, and obviously you can see the benefits of this and um, definitely wanted to be a part of this work. And so he brought me in um, as part of the design team implementation team for this research innovation framework. And so the very first thing that we had to do was decide what exactly is it that we want from our, for our students as they're graduating since high school. So what do we want to see in every single one of our Central High School graduates as they leave Central High School. Um, and going back to the Fourth Industrial Revolution and preparing our students to be uh, future ready, not just career and college ready, but to be future ready, we did some in-depth research around uh, Fourth Industrial Revolution you know, skill sets. I don't even want to call them 21st century skill sets because we're looking beyond that now at this point. Um, and then all of that was evidence-based. Uh, then it was very, very important that everything that we did aligned to our mission and vision. So we had to make sure that everything that we did that we brought to the table was aligned to what we believed in here at Central High School. And then what we did was we had to ensure that we included all of our stakeholder input. Um, and so we put together and designed nine work sessions total after school where we invited uh, every, it was, it was totally open forum, honestly, anybody from the district could come, parents could come, teachers could come, students could come. And over the course of those nine work sessions, we had about 70 different people from the community, from the district, students, teachers, parents, um, come and give a lot of input into these six competencies that you're going to learn a little bit more about. They decided on the six competencies. Um, then we broke them down and defined them in terms of like, what do they look like in research and in theory, but also what do they look like in practice and teaching and learning. And then we laid out some very clear sort of like strategies on how to approach each of those competencies. And this year we spent a great deal of time around professional development on each of those competencies. So after all of that uh, stakeholder input and work sessions that we had, these are the six competencies that we said, these are, the, these are the things that our kids need to be able to exemplify when they leave Central High School. This is uh, student agency or students being an agent of their learning. Um, this is kids owning their learning, right? This is uh, largely built off of Albert Bandura's work. Uh, well, that's, that'll be the heart of what we'll talk about today. The other uh, competencies are advocacy or students being an advocate for themselves. Um, they are kids being thoughtful researchers, empathetic citizens, creative and diversion thinkers, and global leaders. Each of these competencies are teased out uh, in our framework that we'll show you part of today. Um, very descriptive about what it looks like for teachers and for students in my grade level. Um, and so we're, right now as a school, we're, we're focused on agency completely as a school uh, and in every class where we start to ask the question, how can we get our kids uh, to be agents of their learning and how can we have our teachers become agents as well so this is also addresses teacher autonomy and teacher agency um, in addition to student agency the reason why we wanted to focus on agency is because um albert van is the godfather of uh, the leading thought leader on agency and he said that people with high assurance and their capabilities approach difficult tasks as challenges to be mastered rather than threats to be avoided and so many times I think we see where kids are not empowered, teachers are not empowered. Uh, and so avoidance is the easy route. Rather than avoiding, we want our kids and our teachers to say, here's a difficult task. I know that I have the capacity to handle it. 
I'm going to tackle it because I have agency. I know how to organize my thoughts and my actions around the task to complete that task. Uh, and so here's what that looks like in action for us. Here is um, part of the agency competency. These next two screens really are one sheet of paper, but we uh, it so that everybody could see it. We kind of broke it out into two separate sheets. So agency for students and then agency for teachers. You can see the difference between the two. But let's start with agency for students. Um, we're scale we've scaled it out grades 9 through 12, and we want students in ninth grade to be able to learn through activities that are meaningful and relevant to them that are driven by their interest. Uh, and so you'll see that through grades 9 through 12, we want all of our students um, to learn how to design a work plan for themselves. A work plan is essentially an organizational tool that says, here are the tasks that I have to get done. Uh, in addition to those tasks, here's when these tasks need to be completed by. Um, and here are the standards that are addressed with these tasks. Um, and the, the whole work plan idea really helps them prepare for adulthood, helps them prepare for college, or whatever the next step is gonna be for them, because students need to know how to do this thing. The other part is, if you look at uh, 10th grade, you can see there where uh, students start to co-create lessons and activities with their teacher, along with their teacher. This is again, getting students to be an owner of the learning. Is education something that's passively done to a child or something that they have a seat at the table, metaphorically speaking, of their own education? Um, and so once you, if you keep going forward to 11th grade, you can see where students start to demonstrate an understanding in a variety of ways where students can create their own rubrics now in the 11th grade uh, that they give and receive feedback uh, for the purpose of new perspectives to revise and persist. And then by the time they get to 12th grade, we start to see kids interpreting and processing multidimensional information to make judgments about real world needs in their environments. And so you can see how we kind of start to scaffold from grades nine all the way up uh, through 12 about what does agency look like for the student. And then for the teacher, um, all throughout, it, we, it's a really intense focus on personalized learning. It's one thing, uh, it's, it's kind of you know disingenuous to talk about agency and kids owning learning and then do whole group instruction for an entire class period all day every day. Uh, those things are antithetical. And so um, our teachers are starting to learn now what it means to personalize learning um, and what that really looks like here for us in Central. Um, but then beyond that, you can see throughout the, the grade levels what this starts to look like for our teachers as well. We wouldn't start a ninth grader out um, in the 12th grade block and say, here you go, we start here. No, we want to start uh, from a, a very kind of basic approach and build into these skills and these competencies for our students that are transferable to every class. And they're transferable to every aspect of their life. Um, and so that's one big key um, key indicator for us here is that we can take a look at these items and we can see what does this look like in the classroom. There are other things here that are not in our framework that we look for in our walkthroughs, such as metacognitive exit skills, such as minimal teacher uh, lecture, student driven discussion. Um, so these are things that we celebrate, these are things that we look for uh, from, in, from our teachers and from our students when we talk about building agency. And if a student's gonna be a researcher, if a student's gonna be an innovator, it starts with agency. If a student's gonna exemplify any of the other competencies in our framework, then that student has to be an agent of their learning. This really is the foundation for becoming a researcher, for becoming an innovator, is saying, you know what, do I have a voice in what I'm learning? Do I have a voice in demonstrating my learning? Do I have a voice uh, in the pace of my learning? And so these things are crucial. They're foundational to students being successful as agents of their learning. Um, so we're gonna talk really quick about lessons learned. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Dennis so she can talk a little bit about that. Uh, I have a few to add on, but she's going to talk about advocacy and how she has used the advocacy competency in her classroom. Hello, um, my name is Kristen Dennis, and I am a Montessori English teacher at Central High School. That means that I teach ninth through 11th grade all in the same English class. Um, I actually fought for this, so um, so it's uh, my own bed, and so now I'm, I'm lying in, but uh, um, I, because I realized after 12 years of teaching that just because a kid is in ninth grade does not mean they're ready to do ninth grade work. And just because a kid is in 11th grade doesn't mean that they are ready to do 11th grade work. Um, English standards actually work really well for this because um, uh, the progression um, are more skill-based rather than um, content-based. So I have 
lessons learned for Montessori. Um, we do use work plans, but um, I've really learned the lesson of the work plans are less of me just summarizing all of the decisions as a teacher that I've made over the week or the two weeks, and rather opening it up and allowing students to um, choose how they get to the destination. So in uh, Montessori, uh, one of the main tenants is follow the child. And the scary part of follow the child means you are not leading. So you are following the child where they want to go. Um, in Montessori, we also think of ourselves less as teachers and more as guides. And I think that translates really well to um, the research and innovation framework because we are guiding the kids towards where they want to go um, and so how they best demonstrate their learning. So I've really had to um, step back, um, take myself out of the center of the room. Um, and I do have to say a lot of times in the classroom, I am not a necessary component, which can also be kind of scary as a teacher because control, compliance, are often um, kind of the more traditional characteristics of a good classroom. You know, like classroom management is the, the biggest thing that they try to teach you when you are getting your um, teaching degree. And, um, but what is ex most exciting is that if the work is motivating to the kids, you don't need to worry about um, behavior. You don't need to worry about compliance because they are creating their own compliance through engagement with their own learning. Can you talk really quickly, Ms. Dennis, about the advocacy uh, unit you guys did where st students, our, our framework talks about kids uh, being able to recognize systems of oppression in their communities. Yes. So can you talk about the, what that looked like in English? Okay, so um, I always use guiding questions, and so we are doing kind of an American-lit uh, theme. So our first question was kind of what does it mean to be an American? So we read and uh, kind of discussed like those bigger tenets of what it means to be an American. But then as we progressed through the semester, I had students identify a community of which they were a part of and then identify oppression that that community faced. So by the end of the unit, everybody was working on a different project where they were trying to figure out a way to dismantle oppression in their specific community. So I had projects that varied widely from um, students were like, I think the dress code is sexist, so I want to try to like figure out how to like, you know, solve that problem. To, um, I have a student who is, um, you know, an immigrant, and she's like, I want to try to solve the immigration crisis in America. So we had, um, and then everybody, uh, we then had uh, presentations um, that were dictated by the students and then also graded by the students. So uh, just a few more lessons learned. I'll, I'll turn the screen sharing off. Um, so that we can maybe talk to you a little bit more uh, because these next items really do, um, you know, can everybody see me there? Okay. All right. So these, these next kind of few items are things that are lessons learned uh, from us here and I'll turn it so you can all see us. But the first one I, I want to share with everybody when it comes to innovation and this re research and innovation framework, realize that innovation takes guts. Innovation assumes that it's going to be failure and innovation is always worth it. Uh, and they, they all go hand in hand. And I think that, you know, we think back to our original goals, one of my goals here is to encourage people to be innovative. You know, just know that it takes courage to say, to try something different, to say, you know, we're gonna try to, uh, you know, kind of rock the status quo a little bit here and try something that we think is gonna be beneficial for kids. And you can assume that it won't go perfectly all of the time, but it is always worth it in the end. I love going in a classroom. There's no better joy, there's no better joy than going in a classroom and seeing 30 light bulbs that are blazing above kids' heads because they are thinking for themselves, they're critically thinking, they're asking themselves questions, they're finding their own answers, uh, and they are creating new knowledge. How often do we talk about kids creating new knowledge in high school? And so it is always worth it. Is it difficult work? Yes, it is difficult work, but it is always worth it. The other thing I would encourage people to think about when it comes to innovative practices in school and things that we have learned is you have to go slow to go fast. And what I mean by that is there are times throughout our implementation where quite honestly, I wish we would have slowed down more. Uh, and had we done that, we'd probably be further along than we are now. Um, and so I wanna encourage folks that are thinking about, um, you know, trying new innovative practices, or maybe you're thinking about competency-based learning, which is what this is through our r and framework. Uh, go slow, take your time. Uh, get input from folks, get more input than you think you need. Listen, listen, listen. And then along those lines, the last 
kind of encourage folks to think about is you can't listen to kids enough. Uh, and we had student participation in all of our work sessions. Uh, but if I could hit rewind and do this thing over, or I should say, as we continue to move forward and implement new innovations and get better with research and innovation ourselves and our framework, kids have the answers. They really do. Kids have the answers. They're far smarter than we give them credit. They're more brilliant than we give them credit. Um, and so to anybody listening out there that you know is thinking about pursuing innovative practices in your school, start with the kids, listen to the kids, and then put it on repeat in your headset uh, because you won't be disappointed that you did that. Um, so that kind of concludes what we had prepared to talk about today um, of, with our research and innovation framework. And if there's any questions, we'll be happy to take those. No questions right now. Hi, friends. Hey, friends. Hey, Wednesday. Um, you know, I love to show up and out to the central numerous of times. It's so great to hear that you are doing the R&I framework. Um, but can you explain a little bit more of how you are incorporating that into your classroom? I think that's just amazing that you have ninth grade through 12th graders all in that same class. And that's also encouraging for our teachers as well because some teachers may have all of some kids in the same classroom yeah i'd be happy to do that so for us um the way that we talked about um research and innovation in the classroom is uh during the first semester of this school year we gave teachers agency and we said here's the framework you can explore do as little or as much as you want to within this framework so the teachers and students can start to just kind of get a feel for it. And then starting in January, we said, we're gonna get a whole, everybody's kind of has some baseline familiarity. The next step for us now is to get everybody on the same page, talking the same language. And so for us, when we came back in January, on January the 6th, we had uh, three sessions teachers went to in the morning time. One of those sessions was backpack and success skills. Uh, one was research in the library uh, with the best librarian in America, Adrian Lane. And then the third session was with me over agency. And so what we talked about with agency is what that very question, what does this look like in your classroom? And the, after I talked about what the, we gave a session on that and then the PLC time that day was, here are the standards we, are no, we know are coming up. How are we gonna use agency in our classroom relative to this framework? And so for several PLCs within the school, uh, they decided it would be, like I said earlier, a metacognitive exit slip where they asked students to reflect in not a generic way like some exit slips are, but in a deep, meaningful way. Other um, PLC said, no, we're gonna tackle a work plan. We want our students, we're gonna tell the students over the next two weeks, here are the standards that we have to learn over the next two weeks. Help me design assessments for these, help me design a work plan, show me your study schedule for, for these standards that we're gonna cover the next two weeks. That's the way some PLCs decided. And so this idea of agency really starts with the administration being comfortable with a lot of things going on, it really starts with us being able to say, you know, being comfortable with discomfort and not having everybody in a lot step, but trusting folks that they're professionals and they know their kids and they know their practice. Um, and so in a classroom, it won't look the same from English to math. But what is consistent is that students are hearing the same message that, you know, we're building your agency right now. This is what we're focused on as a school. This is a capacity that needs to be built. It's not a switch that gets turned on and off. It's a capacity that's built within you. And so it's in the classroom, it's about language use. Uh, it's about um, building that capacity within our students and teachers, yeah. Awesome. I just want to also, I was taking notes and typing them as you were talking as well, but um, I just want to say three things that you stated that really resonates with me. Um, the first thing that she said is that innovation assumes there's going to be failure. And that is okay because you know sometimes we want our kids to be perfect and not to fail and it is okay if you fail and that is all wrapped up into innovate innovation because if you're not going to innovate then how are you going to learn from those experiences so i think that was very powerful uh, the other thing that she said is that sometimes you have to go slow to go fast and that is also important as well because as you are introducing those skills uh, you may have to start off slow and it's important to start off slow and at the same time that is okay and what i really like the student agency piece that students do have the answers 
um, it is very important to listen to those students, the student voice. Um, and then that is all built up into student agency and then getting them to be owners of that learning. So everything is powerful. And I thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's because we have awesome teachers. That's the yes. 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 And an amazing librarian. That's and an amazing world. librarian. Yes. That's <laughs> <important>. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you for such an amazing show today. Thank you for joining us. Um, to everybody out there, uh, be sure to stay connected to the JCPS Digital Learning um, Work. You can receive on-demand video support by subscribing to our JCPS Digital Learning channel on YouTube. All you have to do is click subscribe on our channel. You can also follow along with the work we're doing. You can contribute to the hashtags, hashtag JCPS Backpack, hashtag we are JCPS, and hashtag JCPS IT3. Uh, all of you at Central and all of you tuning in, thank you guys so much for joining us today. And I hope thank you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.